we have quite a few uh, new names. So welcome everyone um, who has not been here before. So it's um, just about a minute and we'll go ahead and uh, start. My name is Valentina Kuskova and I am the head of the International Laboratory of Applied Network Research. And I'm also an academic supervisor of a master's program called Master of Data and Network Analytics. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the networks. We talked about analytics a lot. We have not talked about networks a whole lot. So it's seven o'clock and let's go ahead and start. So today I want to talk to you about time-driven network analysis. And um, the time-driven network analysis combines two of my most favorite subjects. Um, I love time series analysis, which is analysis of data over time, because it allows us to trace the changes that are happening in our lives from the historical perspective. And time series analysis allows to establish cause-effect relationships. I also love networks, because networks um, so much more informative than any other type of data. So um, those of you who know analysis well know that most statistical methods require that data be IID, independent identity distributed. I am not really concerned about the distribution of the data. I am concerned about the requirement for independence because as I often say, data are never independent. So. Let's talk about combining the two methods, networks and time series, that allow us to overcome the problem with data independence and moreover model both the time-driven and the network stored dependencies. And we'll talk about what we can do with them. Okay, so um, before we start, um, it became a tradition to ask a question. So I'd like to ask a question again. So the question is, private and religious colleges aside, does university education make people more liberal? What do you think? I'll give you a minute to ponder this, and then I would be delighted if you give me some answers in the chat to start the conversation with. So what do you think? Is the person who is college educated more liberal than someone who is not? What's your just gut feeling about that? Here's an answer. Um, the first that we have is yes. So university education makes people more liberal. Any other opinions about that? Depends on the university. Well, um, technically it does, technically. Uh, but like I said, private and religious universities aside. What, um, the reason why I'm saying that is that religious education tends to be more conservative and private education may not necessarily be more conservative, but it does have um, an ability to instill certain views of the private foundation founders, of private um, university founders. So we are not talking about those universities. I mean, there are quite um, a few more universities that are public. And technically in most countries, public education should be religion free and it should also be um, politics free, which of course it's not, um, universities are never free from politics but typically a university which is a place of knowledge should welcome people with diverging political views so when you have those diverging political views on the university campus which is supposedly the norm for state colleges and state universities um, the question is if people get education do they become more liberal all right so we don't have a whole lot of answers and I won't torture you with that. Um, I will come back with an answer to this question because it's not simple. I'm not even talking about the definition of what liberal is, but uh, or the measurement of what liberal is. There are actually many more complexities to this question. So we'll return to that uh, when we talk about network analysis and some of the studies done by our lab. 
But um, let's talk about some things that we will discuss today. Well, first of all, I want to talk to you about what is network. Um, we do have um, somewhat of a wider audience. We have people from different backgrounds. And quite a few of you have been to my previous webinars, but not all of you understand what a network is or may not have studied what a network is. So we're going to talk about that briefly. Then I will introduce myself, this program, and our laboratory. And you will see why I'm doing it in the reverse order, why I think I'm qualified to talk about networks. Then we'll talk about some demonstrations in R. I will show you network dynamics, how the networks progress over time. Then we'll talk about um, the answer to the question I just asked, because this answer is not straightforward and it can actually only be answered with the network time dynamic data, okay? You can't really answer this question by just taking a survey. By the way, why can't you answer a question, does education make someone more liberal by conducting a simple survey? Why don't you just take students' attitudes at the beginning of a school year, at the end of the school year, and then compare? Or at the beginning of education, at the end of the education? Why am I saying that this is complicated? Anyone? Think about this. Um, imagine you have a family that's a that is conservative and you have a social circle, your friends somewhere in the city who are more liberal. And let's say you are talking about politics. Will you be expressing the same views when you are at home with more conservative upbringing and when you are at the university? You are the same person. Let's say five minutes apart. You're at home and then your friends live five minutes apart. Would you have used change in those five minutes that you change locations? Most likely not. But um, unless you are in the environment where you can always freely speak your views, um, people express their opinions conforming to the environment in which they express those views. Even if they're liberal, they won't be as liberal in a conservative environment. And if they're conservative, they won't be as conservative in the liberal environment. Okay, so there are lots of studies about that. So therefore, you can't simply just take two measurements in time. You have to study people's attitudes related to the social environment they're embedded in. And that's one of the important parts that networks allow us to do. Network is the science, so network science is the science between six degrees of separation, as we say. And it all started, well, actually it all started in about 16th or 17th century, but in social network analysis, here is the study in 1929 by Corinthi who talks about chains and links between different people. Now this idea gets further propagated um, by 1967 Milgram's experiment. He actually conducted an experiment of the six degrees of separation where he mailed letters to people. And those people continued to mail those letters. And he was the one that said that the number of links connecting people in his experiment was about six. Those are the people that did not know each other. Now, of course, in 2016, and that was already five years ago, Facebook says that six degrees is now not six, it's just over three and a half. Because we're connected online through social world, uh, through social media, our connections are actually much closer than they used to be. And as we talk about um, this six degrees of separation, here's this quote from the Corinthi essay, we were arguing energetically about where the world is actually evolving. Now we can talk about those things all the time, right? So I suppose humans have been arguing about the world evolving since the time they realized there is a world. All right, so um, networks are all over the place. We here live in a large city, it's called Moscow, and this is Moscow Metro map. And it's a large network because we have nodes that are stations and those stations are all connected to each other. And some of those stations are called reachable. You can get there from any other um, line 
and some of them are not so you can only get them through one line and of course you can present this as a network looking something like that and um, the same network uh, if you think about it um, is actually can be redrawn in a variety of different ways this is the same map and this is the same map and this is the same map now, which one of them would you find more visually appealing or more informative? Um, I tend to think that there are benefits to each one of those designs. It just depends on the preferences and the ease of using this data. I suspect looking through this last network where there are so many different um, nodes of each of the lines connected, um, finding just the right one might be a bit difficult, okay? Um, there was a question asked whether this webinar will be recorded. Yes, we record all webinars and the links will be posted. Now, so what is a network? Okay, if we talk about the network as an entity, the network is a set of nodes and ties between them. As I often say, there is a unit of analysis. In data, the minor or the elementary unit of analysis is one point, data point, one dot. And um, we analyze those dots. We don't expect connections between them, so we can calculate averages and standard deviations and things like that. In a network, the unit of analysis is a dia, which is two dots that could potentially have a connection between them. It doesn't mean they always will, because when they do not have a connection, that's called a null dia, which means a dyad without a relationship. And here on this graph, you can see there are quite a few nodes they're not connected together. So network is um, analyzing relations or uh, potential relations between uh, different dyads. And of course, then there is elementary and substructural analysis, and that's a triad. So we have nodes and ties between them. And networks are applicable everywhere. When I say applicable ever everywhere, yes, it's absolutely everywhere. There are no exceptions. Um, there are some data that is not considered network data, but um, you can answer questions about power, status, and rank. You can talk about motivation. You can talk about communities, effectiveness, spread of everything, not just COVID, right? Now that we all unfortunately became familiar with spread, the models of diffusion and contagion that are analyzed with network uh, approach became very popular again, okay? So networks are everywhere and they're very intuitive because if you think about the social environment, you yourselves each have a network of your friends, family, colleagues, people you interact with. And those networks contain masses of data because networks um, are very powerful. Think about this. They are just, these are just four people posting, um, making posts and reposts on Facebook. So this is from our own research. These are the people who are called influencers nowadays. We called them, we gave them a little, somewhat of a different title. There are only four people. They have generated hundreds of reposts, probably thousands of reposts by now all over Facebook. So if people become influencers, if they create content that gets spread out, then they have a lot of power in that network. And we can, of course, analyze that. So one caveat, uh, well, actually a few caveats, but the first caveat is networks are relational. They study relations between data. When you think about your own personal network, I'm sure you can imagine a few people who have a lot of influence on it. You can think of a few people who you have a lot of influence on, and then there are people that don't really influence each other. So we can talk about strength of a tie. How strongly are we connected to our relations? We um, networks are actually also very powerful because we have regular data. So when I said that the elementary unit of analysis is a data point, well, we all have our own data points, height, weight, income, attitudes, they all belong to us, right? But we also are connected to someone else. And by sharing certain information, we might influence other people or those people might influence us. So we have the relations data in addition to the regular data that we can collect about every person or company or um, other entities. So anything can be a node in the network if there is a possibility of a flow. Like if you think about uh, wireless phones, those are networks, right? 
Okay, so networks are not limiting us to certain analysis. They're actually allowing us to do much more than what uh, a typical analysis could do. All right. Um, and um, there is a science that explains everything that's happening above and beyond that science is called network science and it's a science of relations and the explanations that those relations provide in addition to all other models whether linear or non-linear that we run on our data so networks um, are allowing us to become much more informed about the world we live in okay so what can networks do? Well, then the networks can do a lot. You can, of course, talk about corporate entities, those people who work in business analytics and uh, who are working for the corporate world. They realize the importance of connections between, within the company, between companies, and let's say different people who sit on the board of directors. Um, let's say book purchases. It used to be that Amazon was a book sale company. Uh, if you remember that time, now Amazon is a mar major marketplace that sells everything. But amazingly enough, um, the books you buy sometimes characterize what you might also buy. And don't be surprised if by, after shopping for a book on Amazon, you will get some suggestions about what else you might want to purchase. Let's say a new belt for whatever reason. Um, spreads, right? Here's the spread of tuberculosis. It's a well-known study. Um, I think now the spread of COVID will be analyzed by, uh, for years ahead um, by all network scientists out there. Here's a picture of high school dating. Um, that's a delightful, um, delightfully informative picture, I would say, because it shows people um, dating not only by the class grade, but this is also colored by race. I don't know who is the yellow, who is green, who is red, but it is apparent that the yellows and the greens don't mix up together very much. Now, um, it's not really that informative if you just take the slice of information without those relations. So uh, you will notice that network graphs um, or the images or the plots of networks, they're immediately inferential. They allow us to make inferences just by looking at the picture which is not that easy to do with regular statistical analysis. Well, and of course, there is a very known um, country trade network and there is a major network approach. I mean, it was never called um, network, but it is a network approach called input-output analysis that we use quite a bit in our own work to analyze the impact of a company or an industry on the other countries. So examples are many. Most importantly, networks can do what other methods cannot. Um, for four years, I told the story of uh, computers or uh, more precisely, network analysis predicting Trump as the next president. And there was another important story of Ebola's outbreak when the patient zero, two-year-old boy who was bitten by a monkey was found. And it was the network approach that allowed to stop the Ebola spread. Now, Ebola, of course, is not as wide, it's not as easily spread, it's not as contagious as COVID is. So these network approaches do work uh, for tracing the spread of the disease. And of course, um, network analysts are doing a lot of work right now explaining what the social distance is, right? So we learned what the social distance is. Lots of people did not know the concept of distance. Well, I mean, a network concept of distance that we operate with a lot. So um, networks allow us to see world much better than regular analysis can. So the future of network analysis looks uh, actually very, very bright much brighter than for even typical analytic methods. I've already shown this graph to many of you, but I think it's important to notice that the job market prognosis is more optimistic than for the an, uh, analysis market in general. As you know, uh, the demand for analysts is growing. Now, some people call themselves data scientists, some people call themselves statisticians. We are not going to argue about the terms here. If you are curious, you can watch my webinar about where you want your data science career to go, which I recorded a couple of weeks ago. It's available on our YouTube, YouTube channel. But what is important is no matter what you call yourselves, networks are here to stay and network science is only going to grow. 
And so uh, it's important not only respond to current demand, but anticipate future demand. And we are almost there um, to the introductions where I can tell you more about us, right? So um, analytics market in general is growing. Um, simply because 90% of all the data available to humanity was generated in just the last two years. I've talked about that in my previous webinars, so I'm not providing references. And the need for data analysts continues to increase. It's interesting that um, during the COVID year of 2020, there, one of the few professions for which demand has grown was data analysts. So I think it's important to consider. And so networks, are insightful and fun and uh, have an excellent job prospects. So they, you can do simple models, which are models of social influence. You can do models of social selection. Social influence is how we influence each other, right? Social selection is how do we build ties to other people around us. Have you ever thought about who do you choose as a friend? Right? And what's important? When I ask this question, lots of people say, well, we have to have similar values. Right? So lots of people choose friends based on values. Well, value is just an attribute of a node in network analytic terms. Right? Some people might choose friends based on proximity, how close they are in space. Um, and that's very true for children. So you put two children together in a sandbox and watch them become friends in five minutes. If they're far away and they have to make a lot of effort to bridge the distance, they may not become friends. This is also true for your uh, for our first graders when kids come just come to school, they build relationships based on proximity. So um, how we choose uh, people to be a part of our network is um, part of the advanced modeling um, models of social selection. Now we also have special models, contagion and diffusion that we all know about, community detection, co-evolution models. I will talk about that a little bit today. It's part of time series networks. And then, of course, many others. And today's focus is networks over time. Okay. Now, why do I think I'm qualified to talk to you about networks and networks over time? Well, um, this is me. I am the head of International Laboratory of Applied Network Research. I got uh, all of my education in the United States. In addition to PhD, I also have three masters. One of, th of them is Masters in Applied Statistics. I consider myself social data and network scientist. Uh, I combine three of these areas in the work that I do. I'm also the founder of a master's program called Applied Statistics with Network Analysis. And I'm currently an academic supervisor of that program's mirror called Master of Data and Network Analytics. And uh, the focus today, of course, is on this program, Master of Data and Network Analytics. And just from the title, you can tell that we do something with networks and we know a lot about networks. So let me talk uh, to you about what it is that we know and what it is that we can share with you. Now, Master of Applied Statistics with Network Analysis, the master, the original master program, was found about five years ago. MDNA is its online mirror, which we're just opening. We are expanding opportunities for people to uh, who can join us now, who were not able to join us in the past because they had to travel to Moscow to study, but also because we could not accept too many students. The enrollment in our offline program is limited to about 25 students a year. And we actually historically turned down a lot of international students because we knew the difficulties with transition and the demand from the internal market was quite high. So we would have 60, 70 applications for international, from international students of which we only accept two or three every year. So um, because of the limited space, online approach allows us to accept more international students and um, allow them to have access to the same great education. Now, our program is one of the few in the world that actually focuses on network analysis. Lots of programs offer a course, but one course is not enough. So MASNA is offline and in Moscow and MDNA is online on Coursera platform. Otherwise, they're identical in the content and in the flexibility that they provide. Okay. So um, this program actually combines um, data on real life data with uh, serious analytics, and we offer a large variety of methods. I will not talk about that a whole lot, but we also have that special focus on networks. 
And um, we realized that your needs as students are unique. So our program is very flexible. You um, can do a lot. You can go into business settings or work for the government or the society in general, or you can uh, remain in academia. And um, you have faculty from best universities in Europe and actually best faculty from those universities, the ones who are creators of some of the software, for example, Yanis Demshar. Um, software Orange is excellent for data mining and Professor Zaitsev had a webinar on that uh, a while back. It's available on our YouTube. And on the um, not only do you have a large variety of courses you can choose from, you can also choose the level at which you study. You can start from scratch or you can take more advanced courses. You can find more information about our program by following the link on the slide and Anna will send the link into the chat so you can easily copy it. And for those of you who want to figure out um, what it is that we are teaching, basically just take a look. You can enroll right now in our free Network Analytics for Business Specialization. It's open to anyone. Courses are completely free. If you want to get a certificate of specialization, then I think uh, Coursera charges $49 for that. But education uh, itself is completely free and it's four courses. Um, the overview of contemporary data analysis, the course on networks, an excellent course in business analytics for practicing professionals and an introduction to text mining. Texts um, comprise 95% of all the data that are available to humanity. And um, there are not that many people who teach tax analysis in R, which is the language for statistical computing. Most people teach it in Python, which is a little bit more complex. So we make it more available with this particular course. And um, you can find more about the specialization by um, following this link and Anna will send it to you as well. Well, um, without any further ado, important announcements that I promised. Application deadline for our programs is approaching. It's important um, not to miss the deadline for foreign citizens uh, who are citizen, non-Russian citizens. Application deadline is August 10th. The reason why I'm bringing this up is that um, in a few days, the applications for um, government-sponsored programs will be closed on July 26th, which means we're going to have a flood of applications to the fee-based programs. And uh, we want to make sure we plan ahead for the people who want to apply. So we encourage you to apply as early as possible. For Russian citizens, the deadline is a little bit later, August 16th, but still not that far away. There is still, we are less than a month away. So apply now. Avoid last minute delays, avoid, avoid last minute problems because systems may not work. You'll figure out you need some um, maybe additional documents. So you want to make sure that you're on time. And we are here to help. So contact us, our address is mdna at HEC. And so please feel free to write to us with any questions you may have about the application process, about the program or about anything else. Well, with that, let's talk about network dynamics. Now, um, I'm going to stop the presentation because I will show it to you in R, okay? So let's do that. And I'm going to start with, um, here I've done some testing, so I'll cl clear this up so it doesn't bother us. Um, so I'm going to start with something that I have showed before. And um, this is just to show you how simple, how easy networks are. Um, my son, who is in ninth grade, um, read a book, Dragon by Schwartz, about the um, Lance, uh, the Prince Lancelot who, or the, the knight who was trying to save the city from the dragon. And here is a little movie that allows to see the progression of this um, play because dragon was written as a play. 
So I'm going to just click it on the code. So this is the entire code. I mean, literally just, you know, 15 lines that allows to generate a network movie. So um, there are 65 scenes. Uh, a scene is defined as an actor coming or going. So as a new actor or as a new character enters the play, um, that becomes a new scene. So we have 65 of them. And of course, Lancelot is the main character, or we think he's the main character. And then of course, there are other characters. Now, why are we saying that this is dynamics? Well, that's because the play progresses in time, right? It starts on the first scene and then moves on. So let's look and see what it's like. Now, um, you notice that um, the nodes change the size and they change the size because as each character is more um, involved in the play, the number of times he or she has appeared is the size of the node next time. Plus, of course, there are certain links that are generated here. Now, um, I've highlighted the main characters in the darker colors, so you can see them better than everyone else. But notice how this play is changing, how all of these characters are separating and then getting combined together and separating and then they combine together. Um, if you follow this particular play, you will notice that this aggregation of characters follows the dynamics of the story. Now, of course, there is not a whole lot to this particular story. It's not that um, informative as a network, but it's a fun, picture to have and I want you to see that because um, I want to see I want you to see that it's just a few simple lines of code now let's move on to real-time networks and um, the classic data set that analyzes network is the one the bond data it was um, a data set that actually one of the first collected on networks of college students. I believe there were 46 um, students originally involved in this study. Um, I have actually opened the description of this data set for you. Here it is, it's publicly available and you're welcome to download it um, and play with it yourself. So there were two studies published, one um, by Van der Bund alone and then Van der Bund, Van June and Snyder's in 1999. And um, it demonstrates the use of, at that time, new software that was uh, created for analyzing networks over time. So we have um, labels of the relationships. So they basically, um, people who did not, university Frenchmen did not know each other. And that time was zero. The data were collected at seven time points. Originally, there was a group of 49 students, but with some dropping out, there was only 32 of them left. And then here's the um, labels for those students, best friendship, just friendship, friendly relationship, neutral relationship, or troubled relationship. So you can actually study those different relationships. Moreover, um, there are, of course, actor attributes or the characteristics of each person. So we have gender, male and female. We have the program, two year, three year, four year, and then we have whether or not people were smoking. So those are all things we can study over time. Okay, this is the actual study. Um, I opened it for you so that you can see. And um, it's it's a fun little study. So what I have done is I. Um, downloaded the data set. You can just actually see it right here in my download window. And I have generated a set of networks to reproduce the study and to see how those studies change over time. So again, it's a little bit, you know, more uh, lines of code than there was with Little Dragon, but um, it will also be a little bit more informative. So let's look at that. Um, I'm reading the attributes and gender. I'm gonna color my nodes by gender. Then my first network is the network of these 32 students. Right now it's completely not informative, but I just want to see what it looks like. Now I'm going to generate a uh, set of coordinates that I can plot my network in. All this seems good enough. And notice we have, I believe eight um, boys and um, 26 girls or 24 girls. Um, and then I'm going to do the same thing I just did 
here is our girls and boys. Um, they are all in this group, right? And we're going to go into the slice relationship and look at their relationships that were changing over time. So um, this is the same dynamics. I mean, um, this movie generating software does kind of that thing where it moves the characters. Um, and we can look at it here, we can return to R and look at the time slices. But notice how the relationships were developing. So between time zero or time one in this particular case and time um, two, there was no relationships, right? Um, originally, data were collected every three weeks for the first four periods and then every six weeks. So this is the second period. Notice how these five girls formed what we call a clique. It's a click, well, almost a click because everyone is connected to almost everyone. The girl two is not connected to the other four. I mean, girl 10 is not connected to the other four, but it's connected to the two um, in part of this four click. Notice how three boys or four boys um, on their own and three of them form the triad. And uh, there is one girl who likes this boy number six and that's girl number three, right? So she thinks of him as a friend. He's not really that sure. All right, let's see what happens here. Um, this, these boys form the dyad. Our girls are now a complete clique. So the five girls uh, where one of them was kind of separate, uh, you know, a friend of a friend is my friend. So here they form the complete clique. Here is the, the, this, the, this girl number three who still likes boy number six. But this boy number six is kind of hanging out mostly with boys. And here's the one girl that's connecting this group of girls with this group of boys. And the girl number three who likes boy number six still connects them further with other girls. Now we are looking at this next um, set. Now the boys are together and the boys are together here. And then our girl number three doesn't like the boy number six anymore. She's right here with her bodies hanging out. She gave up on this boy, right? So um, another girl thinks she likes this boy. Now we move on to the next time period and notice how it's now a big, a giant component where everyone is connected to everyone. This actually happens quite often when new groups form. At first, they're like little groups and they all combine together. And then they realize, well, we don't really all like each other. Maybe we're gonna go our separate ways. And this is exactly what happens here. So the large group starts to separate and separate some more. And at the end, we have this um, couple of clicks where um, people are still connected. The giant click of five girls has separated it was one over here. I suppose it's this boy number two who's responsible for breaking up the click of the girls. And the boys are still hanging out somewhat together, all right? Now, how much did that story tell you? And how much of an informative story was it? Probably more of a joke, but if you think about it, in 1999, that was a groundbreaking study because people did not study networks over time again. So um, what we have done in our lab, um, this is of course 20 years later, and we do have a lot more um, opportunities um, to study networks. So I'm going to go back and answer today's question and show you how much more informative networks are than you could think of at first. So this is lab's own study. It was conducted by one of the labs um, at that time um, interns. So the sample was HEC bachelor students in political science. This was class of 2019. The data uh, was a 20 question libertarian totalitarian uh, attitude scale. So as I said, uh, when we talk about liberal, non-liberal, there are so many ways to measure liberal. We're not gonna worry about that part. We're just going to talk about this one particular case, right? Um, the libertarian totalitarian scale. We asked demographic and general interest in politics questions, even though they are political science students. Politics and political science are two different things, right? You might study what politicians do, but it doesn't necessarily mean you want to be a politician. So, um, but we think that at least they're interested in politics, right? And of course we ask them net, uh, network questions. Who do you uh, study with? Who is your support? And they may not necessarily be students. And your friendship, 
who are the people you consider your friends and we have pr provided precise definition but by what we mean uh, by those relationships now our research questions how do students political attitudes change over time and what is the role of the immediate social environment now we designed this as a co-evolution study which means we're interested not only in how people's political attitudes change but how do those political attitudes shape the relationships that they form with other people and well here is that um hypothesis right the question we ask up front when people become more educated do they become more liberal um we did have our hypothesis right so here's our I will show you two networks, uh, friendship and um, study network, because support network included a lot of family members, and we did not um, draw them together with a friendship network, obviously. So this is time zero. Uh, just as studies began, some students knew each other. Note size is identical to everyone. Note color is their attitude on the libertarian totalitarian scale. Notice that um, bright red, and we have a few bright reds, is um, extreme libertarian. Um, light, bright blue, here's this one guy. See, this is an, uh, uh, what we call isolate, right? It's not, here's another dyad. So there are quite a few disconnected people, but this guy is here all by himself. So um, he's somewhere in this dark blue color, more on the totalitarian scale. A lot of people fall in, in this area. Now, the reason why we can make the scale this um, transient color is because we have 20 questions and on each of those questions, there is a scale where a person belongs. So um, technically with um, 20 questions and seven point scale, we have 140 possible values. So somebody can be 140 on one extreme or 140 on another extreme. So there is quite a bit of a gradient between the two. And that's what you see on this picture. So um, time two is at the conclusion of the study, we have measured network several times. What do you think is gonna to happen to our nodes? Anybody wants to guess? Are they going to become more libertarian? Are they going to become more totalitarian? Now that you're looking at this network, you know who is more, who is libertarian, who is totalitarian. Some people are connected to each other. Who do you think is going to go where? And notice, um, I know you cannot see this very well probably, but these are directed ties. So see this little blue guy? There is another guy who is purple, but connected to this blue guy. Now these two guys are mutually connected to each other. Now this red one, nobody connects to him. Nobody calls him a friend or her, I actually don't know the agenda, but he calls uh, four other people friends, okay? So anybody wants to make a prediction of what's gonna happen here? Are they gonna color more red? Are they gonna color more blue or something else gonna happen? Anyone? I know it's not a fair question. I know because it involves, you know, almost kind of um, background knowledge of networks, of how networks operate. We realize that people influence each other, right? These dyads, they're definitely going to influence each other. In fact, they're actually very similar already. One is just a tiny bit redder than the other. Now, there are some, these bright red people that are influencing others and nobody really is connected to them. They're connected to others. So um, what technically should happen is that people who are connected to other people, they should spread their views, right? So these two red nodes should make the others around them more red. Those who are blue should make um, others around them more blue. So we expect people who are in between, somewhere over here, to start coloring more towards red or start coloring more towards blue. All will be purple. Well, actually not quite. This is what happens. So this is the conclusion of the study. The node size now, notice how size is different. The node size is the percentage change in the attitude. So how much did these people actually change? Okay. Um, and notice how these two guys they almost did not change i think um there are some others like this purple guy just kind of this i think is the smallest he did not change at all 
Now, some people have changed quite a bit. Now, notice these two bright reds, okay? They're right here. These are these two bright reds. So we, we drew these networks in the same coordinates, okay? So notice that these two bright reds, they did not change their attitudes, but notice that this formerly purple guy, he is now much more red. So he's moving towards libertarian scale. Now, um, but here's another thing where this purple guy, he is connected to some somewhat purple guys. He is becoming very dark blue. Okay, so he is moving in the opposite direction. Now, same is happening with some other people around here. So notice that we have um, fewer purples. We have, they are starting to move one way or the other. And they're moving one way or the other based on the attitudes of people who influence them. Okay, so um, it's actually interesting because um, there are some, you know, like this guy, changed a lot but he changed towards the more purple color now this guy almost didn't change so here's this diet remember so this is this diet and here it is at the conclusion of the study um one guy did not change at all so this one is right where he or she was this person didn't change a whole lot but um the two people connected to the blue they actually connected to the red ones. So this blue did not seem to have a whole lot of influence on this dark blue because this dark blue has become purple. Now we do have some other things happening. Notice how this triad was more over here. Now one guy changed a lot and became very blue. So as time has passed, people have changed their attitudes quite a bit. I mean, this guy is disconnected, but he has changed his attitudes did he change them and actually he became a group um did he change them all by himself well actually no but i'll show you in a minute so um of quite this kind of almost a red cluster well actually it's not a red cluster we have some extremes this cluster has separated it was mostly purple and now it has separated into people with some more extreme views so some became more libertarian but some became pronouncedly more totalitarian overall network has moved towards bluer or more totalitarian direction. Now, let's figure out what happened with this guy. This is actually the effect of the study network. Same coordinates, um, but study network, they colored exactly the same color. Here's this guy. So he actually turned blue because he was connected to other blue dots. Well, this one is purple, but most of the other dots are actually blue. So um, overall, what are we seeing? If education makes people more liberal, then we should have seen our network becoming more red, right? At least in the, in the colors that we have coded them. That didn't happen. What has happened is people have started to separate into extreme views. Some became more libertarian, some became more totalitarian. Very few remained right in the middle, like these purple guys, okay? They are in the middle. The rest kind of moved one direction or the other direction. And that has happened because of the influence that was exerted on people by each other. We can actually trace those influences. We can see how it changed over time. Hanging out with blue nodes caused some people to become more blue. Hanging out with red nodes caused the people to become more red. And we also were looking at, um, there was another part to the study. I'm showing you time two, there is another time. So there is time zero, time one, time two, and there is another time where some of these, um, so we are observing these relationships as we did with our boys and girls in the previous study. This is the uh, phase where they are actually the most connected together. They're going to break up in the last study, in the last wave, they're going to break up. I'm not showing it to you because this is a part of our course. You're welcome to take our, to enroll in our program and take the course to see what happened to these guys, right? But if you were to guess, how do you think they're going to break up? How would they form new groups? So this is the study network, I mean the friendship one network. 
and this is the same network um, in the study context. So what do you think will happen if you were to guess? Well, I will give you the answer without much explanation, but what happens is, uh, well, first of all, notice how our friendship network has fewer studies, fewer ties. Now these ties, friendship ties will remain. It turns out people remain friends regardless of their political attitudes. I suspect they don't talk about politics or their views on politics um, when they go hang out Friday night for a beer or when they go to a movie or when they you know, go roller skating together. But when they study together, these are political science students. They have to talk about politics. So people with opposing views start to break each other's, um, break apart from each other. So they don't study together because they obviously have opposing views on what they're studying. So this network will break up. Um, the, the friendship network will be much more stable. So what we are seeing is that some of the multiplex networks are actually forming and breaking up based on political attitudes. And political attitudes changed based on who people are hanging out with. And that is called co-evolution, right? Uh, co-evolution of our social circle. And this is something that the network analysis can tell above and beyond the regular study. What do you think would have happened if we just took an average of political attitudes here and an average of political attitudes here? Well, I will give you an answer. You will see practically no difference. Um, you will not, so if you just average the group, so you measure it up front, you measure it at the end, and you will see that the attitudes did not change. And you might conclude that um, people having studied at the political science program at HEC, this is just one very specific case, um, did not change their political attitudes. Is that true? No, it's not. What happens is that simple averages do not tell the whole story. It's the network that tells the story. Um, yes, you can say, well, some people went up, some people went down, but you can't really say why. A network picture tells you the story much more clearly than any other analysis could do, okay? So this is uh, the power of network analysis. And just imagine how much you can do with this tool. Um, and this is just a glimpse on, on the level of pictures. We can predict type formations. We can predict, um, based on these two networks, who will be the next people to form a tie or to break a tie. We can predict changes in attitudes. We can predict um, the dynamics in the networks or the changes in the networks that are not possible to observe without network analysis. So hopefully I have convinced you that networks are fun. You can make movies and movies are fun. But networks also show you a lot of information, provide additional information above and beyond what you can do with um, regular analysis. Um, with that, I am done. And I am actually within my 45 to 50 minutes. Thanks to everyone who has um, stuck it out with me today. Do you have any questions that I can answer? I would be happy to do so. Well, if you don't have any questions, uh, feel free to email us and um, join us um, Join us on our Facebook and our applicants chat. The chat is really for people who are applying to the program. We realize that this program is not for everyone. And so um, if you don't want to apply, we'll be happy to have you with us on our webinars, uh, our ma master classes, and our free specialization, wherever uh, you want to join us. So. Thank you for being here and have a wonderful summer evening. I realize there are other things you might be doing. If you're thinking about applying to a program, remember there are tight deadlines. So we hope to see your application very, very soon and contact us with any questions you may have. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.